ज्ञानदीप अकेडमी इंडिया टॉप कोचिंग इंस्टीट्यूशन फॉर सिविल सर्विसेज प्रिपरेशन Join us online to get most enriching experience from best faculty with excellent notes and specially designed courses. To join the batch, download Nandi Pais Academy app from Google Play Store. For more information, contact nine five double one two eight zero four six five. We are going to start with the second half of the February. My name is Satyajit. On the behalf of Nandip Academy, I welcome you all on this platform, where we discuss the current affairs for the prelims on regular basis. We have already finished with our first half of February month of 2022, and that first half was somewhat loaded with the news. Those were related to the budget of 2022, and this session. Uh, the second half of the february month is going to be again somewhat loaded with uh, one important global event that is happening in the background russia ukraine war right but uh, by this time or the second half of the february that uh, war has not catch some momentum that is going to be in the march of course uh, but in february some events have started we are going to start we are going to focus on those events those topics regarding russia ukraine war uh, which were happening in february month starting with very interesting news that news is again russia russia space agency that is roscosmos russia has a space agency just like we do have uh, as uh, isro russia's space agency is threatening the international space station right uh, by the way what is happening we'll uh, first of all discuss in the background uh, what is the news about let's see amidst the ongoing war the russian space agency that is that is named as roscosmos the russian space agency has threatened that russia could respond to the us russia could respond to the us us sanctions by the way by letting the iss fall from the space what is iss why russia is threatening us or uh, 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 how Russia can you can say be responsible for falling of the ISS from the space? ISS that is called as International Space Station is very important such organization which important such instrument in the space, which is a permanent station of course, which carries out research regarding the space topics just like astronomy, astrobiology, physics, mathematics, right? Biology that can be you can say uh, the research or the inputs can be used for the future missions. and international space station as it the name suggest it is an international collaboration basically uh, of the five different agencies five different space agencies out of those five different space agencies russia and us are the party and uh, as russia is uh, involved in or russia is the one of the main party to the ukraine war and us along with the few european countries are imposing sanctions again uh, against russia economic sanctions against russia russia is counter threatening the this parties us and european countries uh, for uh, the responsibility of the fall of iss from the space okay but the news apart the geopolitics apart we must focus on the objectivities of the international space station what is that station uh, well, you can say by which agreements or the who are the parties what is its purpose and all okay because this news are going to be our regular companion for at least for the next 6 months uh, but we have to pick some objectivities from uh, those news which will be asked in the prelims about iss first of all Uh, it looks somewhat like this international space station which is a permanent station outside the earth's atmosphere somewhere located around 420 or 430 kilometers above the earth surface that is called as low earth orbit okay it orbits the earth the earth or the orbit which is officially called as leo uh, in that orbit it is situated at 430 kilometers it has research equipments it is by the way 
you can say human or crewed station where the researchers can go can reside for several months carry out researches right and that's how iss is an is a modular space station which is located in the low earth orbit the ownership and the use of the space station is established by the international treaties and agreements the main five parties or the main five agencies who are the party to the iss are nothing but the space stations or the you can say space agencies of first of all us that is called as nasa secondly russia that is roscosmos thirdly japan that is called as jaxa fourthly european space agency that is called as esa and the lastly the canadian space station that is called as csa so that's how nasa roscosmos jaxa europe or esa and csa are the five main space agencies those are responsible for the establishment and now the maintenance and operations of the iss as a space station right so it is a joint collaboration of the international space agencies basically five space agencies but but any one country is not responsible for its operation any particular country is not responsible for its maintenance and researches it is carried out on the collaborative basis where the researchers and the scientists from various countries regularly visit that international space station they reside there they uh, carry out the researches they conduct researches right and they uh, you can say out of that researches they provide very important input inputs those inputs which can be used for designing the future space missions the future space missions on let's say for example mars moon and many such other planets right these researchers are particularly uh, in the area of uh, biology or astrobiology or uh, to be more precisely what is the effect of the space like conditions on human body and other biological organisms right and that's how the international space station provides very important or which helps to provide such important input for the research or the missions that can be designed in the future where the biology is involved and not only biology beyond biology about astronomy astrology right astrology by the physics chemistry mathematics of the space all these topics are you can say uh, are researched upon in this international space station not particularly by a particular country but the researchers of the many countries now the station serves as a microgravity and space environment research laboratory in which the scientific researches right research is conducted in astrobiology astronomy meteorology physics and other fields right not astrology by the way it is a uh, iss is suited for the testing of the spacecraft systems and the equipment required for the possible future long duration missions to the moon and uh, mars so various technologies various equipments various gadgets right are tested there they are designed there right they are researched upon there right that is how it serves very important location outside there to carry out the or to uh, conduct the tests for the future space researches right iss is located somewhat like this this orbit is of iss which is around 430 kilometers above the earth surface and uh, which is of course continuously in the revolving position and the the star situation its a star location is called as kennedy space station of florida okay uh, iss orbits at the altitude of 430 kilometers with an inclination of 52 degrees and an orbital velocity of 7.7 kilometers per second so what is the orbital velocity of the iss it is 7.7 kilometers per second right now it is governed by the international space station international space station intergovernmental agreement which is the official name of the agreement by which it is established so i will read that again for you international space station intergovernmental agreement it was signed in 1998 on 29th of january by the 15 government involved in the space station projects so you will you might get confused how 15 we just talk about the five agencies only right but 
Out of those five agencies, one important agency was ESA, that is European Space Agency, which is a group of 11 such European countries. So, 11 plus 4 other space agencies, that is called as, uh, or that becomes the number, or uh, that comes to be 15 in the number. And that's how 15 different governments, the four separate governments with their separate agencies and European Space Agency as the representative of the 11 governments have signed, has, uh, have signed this agreement in 1998, okay. It establishes a long-term international cooperative framework on the basis of genuine partnership for the detailed design, for development, for operations and utilization of the permanently inhabited civil space station for peaceful purposes only. Permanently inhabited civil space station. Okay. So, for research, for design, let's say for example, development, utilization, are all these purposes of the space station. The intergovernmental agreement allows the space station partners to extend their national jurisdiction in outer space. Of course, yes, right. So, the elements they provide, that is, for example, laboratories, are assimilated to the territories of the partner states. And that's how uh, the member states through the International Space Station can extend the their territories in the space and carry out the laboratories, uh, which provides an important opportunity for all these 15 governments, right? The basic rule is that each partner shall retain jurisdiction and control over the element it registers and over the personnel in or are in the space station who are its nationals, you can say their uh, property like situations, right? So, Article 5 of the that agreement, that official agreement provides for this provision. This means that the owners of this space station, the US, Russia, European partners, Japan and Canada are legally responsible for respective elements they provide. All these laboratories is a joint collaboration and all these countries or all these 15 countries or all these five space agencies are responsible for their provision, their maintenance and legal responsibility also. Of all those instruments, they individually provide in the space station. Now, what is the significance of the ISS? Space stations are essential for collecting meaningful scientific data, especially for the biological experiments. What is the space situation? How the biology can be suited to the space situation? How the biology can be redesigned? right or how the uh, suits can be redesigned right and that's how the ISS can be an important location where these experiments or tests can be carried out. It provides the platform for the greater number and the length of the scientific studies than, than available that are available on the uh, uh, yeah just a second to the, uh, the ISS provides for a platform for a greater number and the length of scientific studies right than available on the other space vehicles. So, other space vehicles like uh, spacecrafts or uh, satellites, they are not designed for the research purposes or the testing purposes, right? They have particularly uh, designed precise missions. And how, and uh, that's how the ISS stands different from other space bodies. Yeah. Other space bodies which have or which are which are responsible for the researches or different missions. Let's say for example, rover, satellites. Let's say for example, uh, different you can say uh, the objects which are sent into the space by the human creation. ISS provides for the opportunity for tests and research that are not provided by other space objects which are human induced, right? And that's how each crew member stays aboard the station for weeks or months, but rarely more than a year, right? So, around a year, that duration of the researches there on the International Space Station is around a year. The space stations are used to study the effects of long-term space flight on the human body. This is very important point. The space stations are used to study the effects of long term space flight on the human body, how the space situations are going to impact on the human body. These uh, effects and impacts are tested in the space stations like ISS, right? Who is liable in the case of something goes wrong? By the way, we have just recently discussed uh, the member countries or the member agencies are directly responsible for the uh, products 
the laboratories, the instruments and other such facilities they provide for individually and legally. Right? And that's how the liability is of course on the individual agencies, but the intergovernmental agreement establishes a cross waiver of liability which prohibits any of the five partners or their related entities, contractors, subcontractors, users and customers to claim against another partner. So the counterclaim or the claiming against the another partner, this provision is not provided in this agreement. But the agreement provides for the individual legal responsibility of that member agency for any such fault, for any such defect, right? And that's how uh, the, the Article 16 of the International Intergovernmental Agreement, which is the official agreement through which the ISS is established, provides for these two, you can say, provisions, right? Now, the other international space laws, treaties, space law treaties and the principles in this regard so which are other space laws beyond the iss law right and what are the other treaties for the space the committee on the peaceful uses of the space or the outer space is the forum for the development of international space law it is an international forum it is an international organization that is called as the committee on the peaceful uses of the outer space which is responsible for development of the space law now the committee has concluded five international treaties and five sets of principles first of all we'll look into the five set of treaties uh, designed by the forum on outer space right the international forum on the outer space the first such treaty beyond that treaty which established the iss the five are the outer space treaty secondly rescue agreement liability convention registration convention and moon agreement these five treaties are different or separate points in themselves. I would like to request you all, please go through the texts of these all five treaties. This is going to be a new area of exploration from this news. You should be somewhat or uh, uh, minimally clear with what is called as uh, or what is the intention of the moon agreement. Who are the partner to the moon agreement? Because that's it, two, three liners, right? So please go through all these five agreements. What is their purpose? When they were, you can say, uh, designed? Who are the parties to them? What is the purpose of these agreements? At the same time, the forum on outer space have, the forum on outer space has also designed five such principles regarding the space. The declaration of the legal principles, the broadcasting principles, the remote sensing principles, the nuclear power sources, you know, these are the principles by the way, nuclear power sources principles and the benefits declaration. Again, I have opened up now 10 areas to explore upon. Just two to three lines about each and every principle and each and every agreement. These are the five principles and five agreements you have to cover. Just be prepared with any one of them can be asked in the examination by taking reference of ISS. At the same time, one important area to cover in depth is the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. Right? So you have to cover one more area that is called as what is the committee or where it is situated, uh, whether it is related to United Nations or which is or it is outside the United Nations. The Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space is a forum for the development, right? So please go through that. What is this committee is all about, right? Now, I hope you are clear with the ISS now. Right? So basically, ISS is a space station at the LEO orbit, which is responsible for conducting the tests and researches, which are, again, can be used for the, the design and the conduct of the future missions in the space regarding moon and other planets. Now, uh, just like ISS, it was in news regarding the Russia-Ukraine war. One important news was there regarding Chernobyl, right? And uh, the news was just like this. After a brief but fierce battle, the Russian troops were able to capture the Chernobyl nuclear plant. Around three to four hours it took, right? Uh, in the northern Ukraine, the site of the one of the worst nuclear disasters in the human history. So, uh, the first reference was about 
Russian invasion or the Russian, you can say, takeover of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. At the same time, we have to look into uh, what had happened in Chernobyl, uh, let's say, two or three decades ago. Okay. So, first of all, where is a Chernobyl or where is Chernobyl, the location located, right? <clears throat> if you can observe here, Chernobyl is a city in Ukraine, right? Just north to Kyiv, which is the capital to Ukraine, Chernobyl is located somewhere on the river of Dnieper River, right? And uh, that's how Russia has again conducted raids on the Chernobyl plant and it has taken over, it has, you can say, uh, control. it is now controlling the Chernobyl power plant or Chernobyl nuclear power plant. So why Chernobyl? What is the Chernobyl disaster? The Chernobyl tragedy was a result of nuclear accident on 26th of April 1986 at the reactor number 4 at Chernobyl nuclear power plant near the town of Pripyat, right? In the that uh, Ukrainian USSR because uh, uh, at that time it was Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Okay. And you can observe, you can see the pictures here. The reactor 4 got demolished. There were nearly 8.4 million people, those got exposed to the radiations, right? Uh, in the three nations, by the way, that was very important. There were nearly 8.4 million people exposed to the radiation in the three nations. It occurred when a group of technicians in what was then Soviet-controlled Ukraine carried out a botched safety test that led to a series of explosions. They were carrying out the safety test and that led to accident Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident. It is said to have released 400 times more radiations than the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima in Japan. Right? So, this was about the Chernobyl tragedy. Uh, the year is important, the year is 86. Uh, the location of Chernobyl is important, by the way, for, for this year's prelims, right? Uh, which river is there? Uh, is it north to Kyiv? And a relative location, geographical location of the Chernobyl city that should be remembered. Now, let's enter into the next news. The news is about the Minsk agreement. You might have heard about this Minsk agreement that was several times it was in news uh, because uh, as the Russia Ukraine war is uh, gaining momentum, various countries, including US. Uh, is uh, appealing to Russia to go for again back to the Minsk agreement. So first of all, we'll look into what is the Minsk agreements or what are the Minsk agreements, right? The US authorities have warned Russia not to invade Ukraine and urged both countries to return to a set of agreements. Return to a set of agreements, that means uh, these agreements were conducted, these agreements were signed in the past. Okay, which were signed in 15 and 14, by the way, designed to end a separatist war by Russian speakers in the Eastern Ukraine. Basically, what is the background of the Minsk agreement? Uh, uh, since the 1991 or the fall of the Russia, uh, USSR, by the way, fall of the USSR, uh, it got independence to the many countries, including Ukraine. Ukraine and that's how uh, Russia is or many European countries and US alleged that Russia is getting involved itself into some separatist movements in these countries. Those were erstwhile or the part of the erstwhile USSR. And that's how Russia is backing the separatist movements in many countries, including Ukraine. And this agreement of Minsk or the Minsk agreement is regarding that separatist movements. In Ukraine, there is one region that we are going to Donetsk and Luhansk. You are quite heard or quite familiar with these two terms now. Russia is backing the separatist movements in some disputed territories of various countries, including Ukraine. And these areas now are in under conflict leading to violence. And one of such violence or that area was nothing but Dohans and low, uh, uh, you can say these regions in the Ukraine where now these two countries, Ukraine on one side and the separatist backed by the Russia on the other side, they uh, you can say joined the table, they joined the hands and uh, you can say conducted few, uh, signed few agreements in the form of Minsk 1 and Minsk 2. Right? And that's how 
let us go into the details now what is mins agreement the mins agreements were a series of international agreements which sought to end the war in the donbas region of the ukraine the donbas is one region of the ukraine where the conflict was going on and it was alleged by the ukrainian government that russia is backing the separatist movement in this donbas uh, region right russia is backing the separatism in this region okay and now <clears throat> In first, known as the Minsk Protocol, the first agreement of uh, 14 by the trilateral contact group in Ukraine consisting of Ukraine, Russia and OSCE, that is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, with the mediation by the leaders of the France and Germany in the so-called Normandy format. Normandy is a one geographical location. You can Google for it. What is Normandy and all right. Uh, but in Normandy, it was conducted by the way. Minsk is a particular location. Uh, if you can recall, it is the capital of one of the important country that is Belarus. Minsk is the capital of Belarus where the agreements were signed. The first agreement was signed in 2014. That agreement was regarding a ceasefire agreement. Ceasefire between whom? Ceasefire between the Russian backed separatists and the Ukrainian troops or the Ukraine as a country. Because the main two parties, those who were involved in the conflict, were first the Russian backed separatists or the separatist group in the Ukraine itself and the Ukrainian government. Okay. And where is this conflict is going on? It is going on, first of all, look into this diagram. The, the you can say, highlighted area is Donetsk region. Okay. Here the separatist movements are going on. Few alleged few countries are now many countries alleged that these are backed by uh, Russia. But Russia is of course continuously denies that fact. And the according to first and the second agreement, they arrived at a conclusion that they arrived at an agreement that there can be a ceasefire. The border can be like this, the ceasefire border, right? The political prisoners, the prisoners of the war can be exchanged. At the same time, in these regions, few democratic uh, changes and democratic reforms can be conducted these agreements were in that format that can or that could have led to a peaceful solution between the russia and ukraine by the way but unfortunately these two treaties have failed uh, because of the lack of implementation and the continuous violation of the ceasefire by the both the parties and now the various countries including united states these countries are appealing to these both the parties to come back to the Minsk agreement or uh, go for the another round for the Minsk agreements that can lead to peace-like situations, not only in Ukraine and Russia, but throughout the Europe and the globe, right? Now, Ukraine and Russian backed separatists agreed a 12-point ceasefire deal in the capital of Belarus, that is Minsk, in the September 14. It was a 12-point ceasefire deal. It its provisions included prisoners exchange, deliveries of humanitarian aid and withdrawal of the heavy weapons from the both the sides. The agreement quickly broke down with the violation by the both the sides. In 15, again they tried for means to, right? An open, an open conflict was averted after the Minsk second peace agreement was signed and uh, under the mediation of the France and Germany, now the France and Germany gets involved into this agreement with Russia or the Russia backed separatist movements and the uh, Ukrainian troops, right? It was signed to end the fighting in the rebel regions and hand over the borders to the Ukraine's national troops, right? So this was about Minsk 1 and Minsk 2. Minsk 1 was signed in 14 and Minsk 2 in 15. And what is Minsk? It is a capital of Belarus where the agreements were signed. What was the basic intention or the basic motive of the signing of these two agreements? That was nothing but ceasefire. Ceasefire between whom? Ceasefire between the two parties. That is the separatists in Ukraine allegedly supported by Russia. And the another important party was the Russian government, sorry, the Ukrainian government or the Ukrainian troops. Okay. But both the treaties have failed now. Uh, you should be clear with this Luhansk region, right? And Donetsk region. These two regions are very much important. And one important, uh, yes, Donbas region of the Ukraine. These three important locations that are for uh, the, you can be, it can be the hot area for the prelims this year. Because uh, after this failure of these two agreements, 
और एज दी वॉर स्टार्टेड रशियन प्रेसिडेंट डिक्लेयर दैट वी डोंट केयर अबाउट दिस मीन्स वन एंड मीन्स टू एंड दे डिक्लेयर दिस टू रीजन दैट इज यू कैन से डोनेस एंड दी लुहानस एज अ सेपरेट इंडिपेंडेंट कंट्रीज ओके सो दिस एरिया is going to be hot topic for this year's prelims so please go through it detail okay in the detail format not only pol not politically but uh, geographically also economically also right <clears throat> now uh, the next news is regarding uh, from india by the way the last three news were uh, regarding russia now let's enter into our territory this news is from the agriculture what is a fair and remunerative price frp and how it is spread okay let's look into the details this news is regarding fair and remunerative price uh, what is frp and how it is spread by the way simple in simple terms frp just like the msp we do have in concern with the other food crops 23 25 crops but frp is regarding sugarcane only okay so basically it is a msp for sugarcane which is uh, Uh, which has a different name than msp that is fair and remunerative price because the pricing mechanism of the sugarcane is different than the other food crops and that's why the name also is different from the msp now uh, why it was in news by the way the maharashtra government has issued a government resolution which will allow sugar mills to pay the basic fair that is frp in two tranches right in two installments uh the the maharashtra government has changed their rules and allowed the mills to pay that payment of frp into two uh, you can say different installments sugar mill owners have welcomed the move but however the farmers are not happy with that of course right but <clears throat> the news apart let's go into the details of the technicalities of frp how, what is this and how who determines that everything right FRP is the price declared by the government, which is which the mills are legally bound to pay to the farmers for the cane produced or cane procured from them. The farmers produce the sugar cane or cane, right? And uh, the uh, you can say the factories, the sugar mills, they procure that sugar cane from the farmers. But at what price that is determined determined by the government, and the government decides that price at which the mills will procure the sugar cane from the farmers. That price is fixed, and which is a mandatory price that has to be paid by the mills to the farmers. That is called as the FRP, that is fair and remunerative price for the sugar cane. Okay, which is paid by the mills to the farmers. The payment of FRP across the country is governed by the sugar cane. control order that is called as 1966 it is uh, a sort of legislation sugarcane control order of 1966 which governs the processes formulas rules and laws regarding the frp and the sugarcane procurement right it 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 mandates the payment within the 14 days of the date of the delivery of the cane the mills have to pay the Uh, remuneration or you can say frp to the farmers within the 14 days of the delivery of the cane okay but uh, it is rarely followed how the frp is decided by the way frp is based on the recovery of the sugar from the cane the recovery uh, how much sugar how much sugar content is there in the sugar cane that uh, that determines the you can say the price that is frp higher the recovery rate Higher will be the FRP in that simple terms. Okay, FRP is based on the recovery of the sugar from the cane for the sugar season of twenty one twenty two. The FRP has been fixed at twenty nine hundred per ton at a base recovery rate of ten percent. Right, so ten percent sugar. Let's say for a kg one hundred gram. Sugar recovery is the ratio between the sugar produced versus sugar crush or the cane crushed expressed as the percentage. The ten percent base rate, pakadun twenty nine hundred high have a C F R P as nare. The higher the recovery, the higher is the F R P, and the higher the sugar produced. Right. So the quality of that cane determines the F R P. Higher the sugar in that cane, higher will be the F R P. Okay. The central government announces F R P, which is determined. on the recommendations of cscp that have we have a separate commission for determining msp and frp that is the commission on agricultural prices cost and prices and it is announced by the cabinet committee on economic affairs by the way in simple terms the uh, 
Commission on Agricultural Cost and Prices determines the F, uh, FRP and CMSP. Here, FRP, it recommends that FRP to the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. And that Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs on the behalf of the government announces the FRP. And likewise, MSP also. Okay. In simple terms, FRP, sorry, CACP, that commission is just a recommendary body in terms of the technicalities, prices, costs and all. Uh, the ultimate, you can say, decision making body is nothing but the cabinet committee on economic affairs. CCEA is chaired by prime minister. And uh, one more question for you, which other cabinet committees are chaired by prime minister then, right, beyond C, uh, economic affairs? The FRP is based on the Rangarajan Committee report, right, on the re reorganizing the sugarcane industry in India. Uh, basically, three important points we have learned. First of all, who recommends the FRP? It is cabinet. I am really sorry that uh, it is the commission on the agricultural cost and prices, which is a recommendatory body who determines the, uh, uh, you can say FRP, who declares the FRP. It is the cabinet committee on economic affairs on whose recommendations the commission determines the prices FRP. It is on the recommendations of the F Rangarajan report, right? Now, significance of FRP, assured payment is one of the major reasons why the cane is popular crop with the farmers, assured, right? So, which is the payment is mandated by the law, law called as the order of 1966, right? Delays in the payment can attract an interest up to 15% per annum at the sugar and the sugar commissioner can recover unpaid FRP as dues in the revenue recovery by the attaching properties of the mill. So, it is very much a secured, safeguarded payment, assured payment and that's how sugarcane has been now a famous crop among the farmers because of this order or the legalities involved in the uh, payment of FRP, okay? Uh, simple points about sugarcane. By the way, I hope you are good with now FRP. Uh, simple terms, FRP is nothing but a price that a mandatory price declared by the central government which has to be paid to the farmers by the mills, right? On the procurement of the sugarcane, okay? And that is recommended by the Commission on Agricultural Prices that is CSCP and uh, declared by Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. And whole mechanism of deciding the FRP, all those formulas and all, it is based on the recommendations of the Rangarajan Commission, in which Rangarajan Commission had uh, again recommended for consideration of the production cost, right? There are two important factors, by the way, uh, in deciding the FRP. First of all, the production cost of the sugarcane, and second, a fair price for the consumers. Right. So all these, both the two factors are taken into consideration by the Commission on Agricultural Prices and Cost, that is CSCP, on the basis of which a formula is decided every year and based on that formula, the prices are, you can say, calculated in terms of FRP, which is recommended to the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs and Cabinet Committee on Econ Economic Affairs ultimately decides and declares that FRP. Sugarcane. It is a tropical crop. Temperature it requires is 21 to 27 degrees Celsius with hot and humid climate. It is a tropical crop, right? Rainfall around 75 to 100. It is a water intensive crop. Soil type deep rich loamy, right? Top sugarcane producing states in India, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Bihar. India is the second largest producer of the sugarcane after Brazil, by the way. And uh, this sugarcane industry, the industry uh, is very much famous in men's area, in Pepperman geography, where a uh, few years back, UPS had asked one simple question or one important question, why the sugarcane industry is shifting from north to south, right? For, but for prelims, what is FRP? And uh, at some geographical details, some geographical requirements about sugarcane crop is our prelims perspective. It is our prelims syllabus. But for mains, it can be used as, it can be asked as an industry, right? Sugarcane industry. Now, let's go into the next news regarding PMLA. That is uh, Prevention of the Money Laundering Act for the very famous reason. PMLA has been in the news for, let's say, for many months now. But uh, one important or it was at the peak of the popularity because of this news. 
controversy over the series of the raids and arrest of the politicians their relatives the activists under the prevention of money laundering has made that supreme court uh, to step in and uh, check the misuse because the allegations on the central government on the government are nothing but the misuse of the pmla okay the government agencies are misusing the provisions in the pmla and using that as a tool to raid the opposition party members opposition political members and their relatives okay but the news apart for prelims what is required it is required uh, about uh, details of the pmla and in addition to that we have that syllabus of money laundering in gs3 for the mains and where the analysis of pmla is required okay to what extent the pmla has been working uh, with its proficiency uh, to what extent the pmla act is successful in countering the money laundering all these areas will be asked in the mains but what is pmla it is a prelim syllabus okay what is money laundering we'll start with that money laundering laundering karna na so kapde dhuna apan swachh karto so money la ji black money ase tela white karna that is money laundering money laundering is defined as a illegal process of converting money generated through criminal activities such as drug trafficking terrorist funding to appear to have come from legitimate sources so we uh, create a perception uh, or the money launderers create a perception through various um, uh, series of transactions that the money that has came that is in the very clean format okay so that is money laundering process money laundering from the criminal activities is considered as a dirty or the black money or dirty money and the laundering process makes it look cleaner just like the laundry in terms of clothing works right so money laundering about the prevention of money laundering act it was enacted as a response to the india's global commitment on the vienna convention to curb the minas of the money laundering so on the global level we have vienna convention regarding money laundering and uh, the vienna convention mandates the each of the parties each of the party countries to the vienna convention to enact such legislation at the domestic level to prevent the money laundering okay and india by mandating to that you can say commitments enacted the law pmla right objectives of pmla was enacted uh, sorry pml was enacted in 2002 and it came into force in 5 to curb money laundering a process of converting black money into the white okay and to provide for seizure of property derived from the money laundering and that's how india enacted the prevention of money laundering act in 2002 which uh, was again came into force in 5 which was mainly intended to curbing the practice curbing the practice or the issue of the money laundering and at the same time attaching the property that was gained out of money laundering okay now there are three main objectives of pmla to prevent and control the money laundering to confiscate and seize the property obtained from the laundered money right prevent and control then confiscate and seize the property and to deal with any other issues connected with money laundering in india okay there are three objectives uh, of pmla dispute redressal there is one body called as the adjudicating authority aa the adjudicating authority is appointed by the central government it decides whether the property attached or seized is involved in the money laundering or not the adjudicating authority shall not be bound by the procedure laid down by the code of civil procedure it will be bound by or it will be guided by the principles of natural justice right uh, and the subject to the other provisions of the pml so there is no binding on the way they can uh, you can say process in regarding to the offenses in the pml they will be bound by or they will be guided by the principles of natural justice who the adjudicating authority while adjudicating upon the issues of pml whether that property attached is at the property out of money laundered or not okay now the appellate tribunal is such another body the first body we talked about is the first aa that is adjudicating authority second is about appellate tribunal an appellate tribunal appointed by the central government is given with the power to hear the appeals against the aa that is adjudicating authority that is it appellate tribunal right orders of the tribunal can be appealed in the appropriate high court then beyond that the third organization under the pmla or that act by the way these all are the provisions of the uh, 
prevention of the money laundering act okay so first is adjudicating authority the second provision is regarding the appellate tribunal and the third will be regarding the special court the provisions of the establishing special court by the union government under the pmla uh, yeah of course pmla has the provisions to establish one special court regarding the uh, hearings of the appeal against the uh, aa and uh, appellate tribunal okay so special court can be established in that case in 2012 the central government or the parliament carried out a few amendments to the act the it adds the concept of reporting entity it adds the concept called as very important reporting entity which would include a banking company financial institution intermediary okay so these are the reporting entities according to the pmla the pmla 2002 levied a fine up to 5 lakh the earlier it used to be a fine up to 5 lakh but that cap has been now removed by this amendment of 12 now the fine can be beyond 5 lakh also it has provided for the provisional attachment and the confiscation of uh, property of any person involved in such activities okay these three important amendments were done with the act of 12 what has the supreme court said i regarding pml the very concept of offense of money laundering in the prevention of money laundering act pmla is very wide wide right and any activity connected with the proceeds of the crime is encompassed within the expression of the money laundering under the legislation so that's how according to supreme court of the judiciary the act of money laundering has uh, or the concept or the term called as money laundering has a very wide connotations and many such offenses uh, can be printed under money laundering okay so that's how the supreme court or the judiciary has made the concept of money laundering a very wide concept right now what has the petitioners uh, petitioners are demanding the section 3 of the pmla has to be read down to say that a mere use and possession of the proceeds of the crime mere use and the possessions of the proceeds of the crime does not tend to amount to the money laundering according to the petitioners the section 3 of the pmla has to be read down to say that what does it mean the pmla has the section 3 right in which it has been read it, it has been written here like the mere use and the possession of the proceeds of the crime does not tend to amount to money laundering there has to be something more and there has to be uh, you can say there has to be a production and the petitioners are demanding to read down this section of the pmla okay that is again a valid uh, argument right this was about uh, the pmla uh, as it was in the news because of the misuse that is going on of pmla by the central government uh, and that's how the petitioners are demanding mere possession of the uh, proceeds of the uh, you can say the mere possession out of the proceeds of the crime does not lead to money laundering itself okay so uh, the possessions or the property out of crimes can be treated with the other laws than the pml and not pml itself and that's how the petitioners are demanding uh, to stop the misuse of pml to stop the misuse of the word the criminal proceeds and all uh, in the pml okay now the next important news regarding tribunals uh we think that this area especially is going to be asked in the mains right uh, because the area that we are going to discuss is about the conflict of judiciary and the executive or the government okay and upsc will ask this question for mains uh, or this year's mains we cannot claim that by the way but there are uh, there is huge possibility of asking this question or this topic because the um, uh, now it is the conflict of judiciary and executive is reaching to its peak okay let us discuss about what is going on or what is the conflicting areas on which there is a continuous struggle between judiciary and executive as you know the indian constitution provides for the concept called as separation of powers right according to the separation of powers the three important organs of the government these are called as uh, executive judiciary and legislature are to be provided with the separate powers they have the separate area to deal with, deal with right they have separate jobs to do first of all the legislature will make laws amend the laws the executive will execute or implement those laws and if anything is going wrong in that case the judiciary will adjudicate upon the judiciary will have a look on 
a watch on this all the processes and all the laws okay that is the simple area the idea of the pillars of the government and they have different jobs to do that is called as the separation of powers and uh, now it is highly you can say valued value for that all these organs should work independently work separately as in the american constitution there is a watertight separation of these three organs and uh, nobody or no any organ organ interferes into the work of the other organ but in indian constitution we have balanced that power we have balanced uh, separation complete separation of power with checks and balances because indian constitution believes that a complete separation of power will be an artificial concept where these three organs can be used as a check and balance against each other for example uh, when a law is passed by the parliament which is in controversy or which is in the uh, you can say uh, conflict with the values in the constitution the law can be declared as a null and void by the judiciary isn't it a check and balance situation right at the same time the members of judiciary are appointed by the executives okay and judiciary with its instrument in the hand called as judicial review under article 13 of course with the help of judicial review or judicial activism or judicial overreach the judiciary can you can say stuck down many acts processes by the executive and judiciary sorry executive and legislature and that's so all these three organs in india that is judiciary legislative and executive executive they you can say have a, a very complex web of relationship at times they act as checks and balances and some other times they are required to get they are required to maintain distance from each other and that area which is a gray area of uh, uh, proper separation or not separation these areas are again the areas of conflict between this uh, any of the two organs between these two uh, or among these three organs and that's how judiciary is in continuous conflict with the other organs including legislature and executive now that conflict between judiciary and executive has reached to a new level a new area has now been opened up and uh, if you can recall in 1415 there was an institution called as national judicial appointments commission njac njac was in that instrument where the central government uh, will now will have say on the appointments in the judiciary and that was struck down by the judiciary as an unconstitutional instrument right national judicial appointments commission was struck down by the judiciary citing its unconstitutionality because the independence of judiciary is a basic structure of the constitution under keshavananda bharati case the same argument of independence of judiciary has been now used in this news so let's talk about what is going on regarding tribunals but first of all let's talk about tribunals what is a tribunal the main function the main uh, task with the judiciary is to adjudicate upon the cases to uh, decide upon the cases to give justice but you know that the indian judiciary is overloaded with the number of cases and that's how it is leading to a huge pendency in judiciary that pendency is now somewhere around 3.6 crore cases which are pending in judiciary and out of which 85% of the cases are with the lower courts including high courts and the subordinate courts right and considering the number of judges versus the cases before them it is going to take 414 more years to resolve those cases with the present rate of disposal right the speed at which the judiciary is disposing the cases before it it is going to take 400 more years to dispose all these pending cases <laughs> and that's how uh, the idea like tribunals come into a uh, place uh, uh, takes an important position where the government central government through other institutions is uh, trying to reduce some load on the judiciary there are certain areas which are highly specialized in nature for example industrial disputes environmental disputes international disputes the disputes relating to the intellectual properties 
these are the civil disputes let's say for example among the civil service civil servants one civil servant is aggrieved party uh, which alleges that uh, or the uh, aggrieved party against his boss there are very various civil matters those can be treated differently those can be you can say adjudicated upon by the different bodies than going to the mainstream judiciary and that's how tribunals act as an important instruments to take decisions to decide upon the disputes to resolve the disputes among the parties without going to the mainstream judiciary the idea of tribunal was introduced by the government Indira Gandhi government to be more precisely by the 42nd amendment of 1976 where by that amendment of 42nd the the government or the parliament introduced two important articles in the constitution uh, in the name of article 323a and 323b where article 323a was to be a uh, article that will govern the administrative tribunals and the b that is 323b will govern the other such tribunals basically what is a tribunal a tribunal is a quasi judicial body a quasi judicial body because it is different from the mainstream judiciary it is different from supreme court high court and the subordinate courts and that's how as it has a decide decision making powers it has a adjudicating powers it is a judicial body but why quasi because it is uh, appointed by the executive or it it works under the executive so quasi judicial body so a tribunal is a quasi judicial body under the constitutional provisions of 323a and b if it is a administrative tribunal just like cat and sat it can be established under the article 323 by the central government or the tribunal if it is of the other nature it can be established by the central government under 323b just like we have the tribunals in the income tax area the national green tribunal many other such tribunals okay which adjudicate upon the specialized issues and in those areas the central government or the government intends to make certain changes which are now disliked by the judiciary there are many areas of the tribunals where the judiciary is involved judicial appointments are involved the appointments of the judicial members is involved and if central government is involving into that matters which are purely of judicial concern the judiciary is raising the concerns about its independence okay so let's look into the details of that what is going on regarding this act of 2021 why it is uh, being held as a controversial and uh, several other issues regarding it right now let's start with the details first of all the tribunal reforms act of 2021 the supreme court has observed that the government's boot to the introduce a uh, statute last year on key tribunals uh, that to merely the days after the court struck down an identical law may amount to dishonoring the judgment first of all the central government had already introduced one ordinance regarding this tribunal ordinance right and that the ordinance was struck down by the judiciary itself but again by disrespecting that uh, judicial order the central government it introduced again in the form of a law or a legislation okay and that was passed by the both the houses of course with the majority what is the issue by the way and uh, yes of course supreme court is treating it as an it's you can say insult dishonor right the tribunal reforms act 2021 has been challenged in the court the petitioners argue that the law series is a serious threat to the judicial independence how we are going to say it how it is a threat to independence by giving the government wide pass regarding the appointment service conditions salaries etc of the members of the key tribunals the key tribunals like uh, you can say the film board tribunals airport authority tribunal and all these uh, these tribunals used to have some say of the judiciary while in the appointments and uh, the service conditions of the members but now the central government instead of judiciary will have more say in that matters in those matters and that's how that is being a controversial point and according to the petitioners the increased control in the hands of the executives against judiciary regarding these matters is nothing but it is a threat to the independence of the judiciary and as you know the independence of judiciary is a basic structure under 
the Keshwanand Bharati case, right? Petitioners have argued that the act was introduced in the Lok Sabha just days after the Supreme Court stepped down the tribunal reforms ordinance. The act brought back a very same provisions. So this is again an insult, right? The controversial provisions, kutla kutla, by the way, the Tribunals Act 21 was passed in the both the houses last year. Okay, the Tribunals Act 21 was passed in the both the houses last year. The law has triggered a fresh standoff between legislature and judiciary over the powers of the powers and the limitations on lawmaking. As per the act, the minimum age criteria is of 50 years. As per the act of the Tribunal Act of 21, the minimum age criteria for the appointment to get into a tribunal is minimum 50 years right by the advocates as the members of tribunals and the tenure is of four years this is going to be controversial uh, or the main area of contention between judiciary and the executives because uh, the main career or the key positions in the judiciary are achieved after the 50 years position or the 50 years itself and in that years, getting appointed on the tribunals is not so much important position to get appointed. This is not official by the way. It can be a simple interpretation of what is going on. And that's how judiciary thinks that uh, these positions in the tribunal are not so technical in nature. Uh, and after 50 years, considering the pendency before the judiciary, the members are required into the mainstream judiciary on high courts, supreme court. And if you, if the central government appoints these mainstream judicial members on the tribunals, how can the load or the pendency can be reduced? Right? So as per the act, the minimum age criteria of 50 years is going to be the main contention area between the judiciary and executive and uh, the, the judiciary is again showing some concerns regarding this provision. Right? Earlier, there was no such point or the no such condition about the, uh, you can say, uh, year of appointment. The court found that the caps are arbitrary, but the government has argued that the move will bring specialized talent and advocates to pick. And the advocates to pick from, the pool of advocates to pick from will be specialized pool according to the government. But judiciary knows what exactly is going on. Section 3.1, Section 3, uh, 37 and 571 are the ultra was to the articles of 14, 21 and 50. And you know, Article 50 is nothing but about the uh, separation of executive from the judiciary. 21 is about right to life and liberty and uh, in which various other rights are covered, including fair justice, free and fair justice, speedy justice. Article 14 is about rule of law, equality. So all these provisions in Article 50, 21 and 14 are getting violated according to the judicial judgments. Okay. Section 3.1 and Section 3.7 now. Section 3.1 bars the appointment of the tribunals of the persons below 50 years of age that we had already discussed. That is going to be the main important area of the contention between judiciary and executive. And 3.7 of the Imposed Act, right, which mandates the recommendations of the panel of the two names by the Search Com Selection Committee of the Central Government violates the principles of separation of power because uh, according to Section 3.7 of this new Act, there is going to be a, se a selection committee in which the Central Government will have more say than the judiciary and at the same time, because of that, uh, the involvement of the Central Government in the Selection Committee, Search Com Selection Committee, at the same time, the more numbers with the central government is nothing but uh, the violation of the principle of independence of judiciary, right? Now, highlights of the tribunal's reforms, uh, you can say Act of 21. The law seeks to provide for the uniform terms and conditions of the various members of the tribunal and abolish certain tribunals such as, uh, as a part of its bid to rationalize the tribunals. So basically, what is the main intention of 21 according to the central government it is to for the uniform terms and conditions for various members of tribunals because we have n number of tribunals in the country in many areas and to bring uniformity among them uniformity among the uh, members uniformity among the uh, you can say regarding the service conditions uh, expertise and many such other provisions or the tenure etc service conditions to bring uniformity across the tribunals the act has been introduced according to the central government in addition to that as a part of its bid to rationalize the central government is now doing away with total five tribunals 
now the existence of the these five tribunals will be no more right and that's how it is a process of rationalization because according to the central government a lot of resources are getting wasted on maintaining these tribunals which do not have that much of work according to central government and those five tribunals will be the film certificate appellate tribunal airports appellate tribunal authority of advance rulings intellectual property appellate tribunal and plant varieties protection that is one tribunal uh, these tribunals will have no uh, have will ne will no more have existence uh, because according to this act of 21 these all five appellate tribunals are going to be diminished okay it seeks to dissolve certain existing appellate bodies and transfer their functions to the other existing judicial bodies because according to central government the act of 21 intends to bring some rationalization in the judicial processes bring some rationalization in the functioning of these tribunals it seeks to empower the central government to make the rules of qualifications appointments the term of offices salaries allowances resignations so all these powers are going to be do or going to be with the central government so uh, don't you think it is going to be a very important issue uh, if uh, judiciary is concerned because it is threatening the independence of judiciary itself right it provides that the chairperson and the members of the tribunals will be appointed by the central government on the recommendations of the search com selection committee and of course the search com selection committee in itself is a controversial point where the search com selection committee will have the membership from the central government in more numbers that is 2 plus 1 right and the central government having the more say in the search com selection committee is nothing but a threat a perceived threat by the judiciary on its independence okay it provides it also provides the composition of the committee to be headed by the chief justice of india right or the judge of the supreme court nominated by him for the state tribunals there will be the separate search committee union government has to preferably decide on the recommendations of the search committee uh, within three months of the date of the recommendation so this is going to be another important area of contention because the the union government has to preferably decide on the recommendations of the search some collection committee within three months of the date of the recommendation so within three months of the recommending the names by the selection committee the central government has to take decisions regarding their appointment okay tenure the chairperson of the tribunal shall hold the office for a term of four years or till he attains the age of 70 years whichever is earlier four or 70 other members of tribunal shall hold the office for the four and 67 so whichever is earlier so these are the you can say the provisions of this new act of 21 what had the court ruled and what are the uh, you can say key issues with the law by the way the Supreme Court in the case of Madras Bar Association versus Union of India had stepped down the provisions requiring the minimum age of the appointment of chairperson or the member as 50 years and prescribing the tenure of four years. So uh, the court already has, you can say, stepped down the provisions of 50 and four year tenure. At the same time, it held that such conditions are a violative of the principles of the separation of power, independence of judiciary and rule of law under Article 14 of the Constitution. Right. So all these three principles, separation of power, independence of judiciary and the rule of law, they form the part of basic structure of Indian constitution according to Keshwan and the Bharati case of 1973. Right? I hope you are good with this. Now just to revise with this was a long news by the way. Uh, first of all, we will discuss uh, what was it. Uh, this was regarding the Tribunals Reform Act 1921. Uh, the central government is willing to have some uniformities in the functioning of the tribunals and that's how it has enacted one important law called as tribunal reforms act but it has now cast or it has now been caught into a controversy regarding the tussle of the judiciary and executives or the tussle between the government and the judiciary because according to judiciary it is nothing but the violation of independence of judiciary because of its provisions in it and uh, according to the central government, what central government argues is we are rationalizing the tribunals. We are making tribunals more efficient. We are making tribunals more uh, expert or expertise, right? And that's how these counter arguments and arguments is leading to the tussle between the judiciary and executive and the judiciary has struck down the act again, just like the ordinance citing the issue of independence of judiciary. Okay, now let's move to the next news.
the next news is regarding uh, urbanization sustainable cities india program another a new program on a very important scale by two important institutions by the way let's look into the details of what is the program first of all the world economic forum and the national institute of urban affairs that is niua have signed a mou to collaborate on a jointly designated or they have jointly designed sustainable cities program right uh, so uh, which two important institutions are involved in this that is first is economic forum world economic forum wef uh, the forum or the institute in the first half of the february we discuss into details and the second is national institute of urban affairs okay this is the government of india's institute and this is a global ngo right now sustainable cities program or sustainable cities india program intends to enable cities to decarbonize in a systematic and sustainable way that will reduce the emissions and deliver resilient and equitable urban ecosystems simple we have to make our urban locations urban habitats we have to design them we have to plan them we have to how you can say structure them on very sustainable manner which will have least carbon footprint right and that serve the least impact on the environment and this program that is sustainable cities india program intends to make our uh, cities or intends to design our cities on that platform okay implementation the forum that is world economic forum and niua will adapt the forum's city sprint process this is one keyword that is a city sprint process and toolbox of solutions these two concepts are the concepts designed by world economic forum these are processes some tools and etc these toolkits are designed by world economic forum in which india's institute that is the national institute of urban affairs will adopt to these two uh, tools they will uh, you can say uh, take these two tools from the world economic forum to design indian cities uh, for the decarbonization in the context of the five to seven indian cities across two years okay so i just uh, read it once again the forum and niua will adapt the forums that is world economic forums city sprint process there we are going to look into it then uh, the toolbox of solutions for decarbonization in the context of five to seven cities over the next two years so what is city sprint process okay the city sprint process is a series of multi-sectoral multi-stakeholder workshops it is a workshop right it is a workshop process involving businesses governments and civil society leaders to enable decarbonization especially through the clean electrification and circularity okay so through clean electrification and circular do have you heard about the circular economy right have you heard about it circular economy is a type of economic development a new design of economic development based on the sustainable lines where the resources are used in a circular manner okay so with the intention of the minimum waste okay so uh, this process uh, called as sustainable or the city sprint process will be based on circularity right the next the such concept is or the next point is the city sprint process uses the toolbox of solutions so what is a toolbox of solutions a digital platform containing over 200 examples of clean electrification efficiency and smart infrastructure best practices and case studies across the building so it will be a digital platform uh, covering around 200 examples of the best practices throughout these areas and mobility from over 100 10 cities around the world so all these systems were uh, on the global level wherever these important you can say uh, the projects are going on on efficient lines right uh, which are called as the best practices these all the examples will be covered in the toolbox that is a toolbox of solutions okay so the two important concepts were the city sprint process in the form of workshops and a toolbox of solution uh, a solution box in the form of digital platform where the best practices are listed these two tools are the tools of world economic forum together with niu where these two institutions are going to adapt these two tools to uh, redesign decarbonize indian cities over the next two years okay so this was about the uh, you can say the program called as sustainable cities india program okay the next news was regarding one important tribe in northeast that tribe is called as cookie tribe 
okay so why it was in news by the way let's look into it the center has assured that it will hold peace talks with all the cookie militant groups and their issue would be resolved in the next 5 years this was the news by the way the context is that the cookie tribe is demanding for the separate state okay so the militant outfits such as the cookie national organization and the united peoples front where they where they are demanding for a separate state of the cookie tribe in manipur so this was the context of the news because the cookie tribes are demanding the separate state but the center as i should it will hold peace talks they will listen to their demands okay the area the projected area of cookie land which they are demanding is something like this okay uh, this is manipur state wider manipur state and the pink will be the cookie land the demand for separate state the community today feels that despite never bowing to the british their contribution in overthrowing the colonialists has never been acknowledged they are feeling isolated in that sense rather it has left them vulnerable even after india gained independence as their demands are not being heard in a proper manner okay so manipuri manipuris especially kuki tribes are feeling alienated over their rights over their uh, uh, you can say representation over their legal economic cultural rights rights over lands and especially their contribution during freedom fight was not being recognized okay basically the kuki people are an ethnic group native to mizo hills right or uh, formerly lusha hills in mizoram in northeast india they are present in all the states except arunachal this is going to be the most important point uh, they are present not only in manipur but they are present in all the states except arunachal the kuki rising of 171917 to 1919 also uh, seen as the anti colonial freedom struggle of the kukis was fought against the british to nothing but preserve their land and during world war 2 also the kukis joined the indian army to fight the british government this was about the lusi or uh, kuki tribes where they are demanding for the uh, you can say separate state but some details about them uh, in this slide okay so where they are Uh, from uh, which states to do they belong to right and that's how what is their contribution to the uh, freedom fight so the contribution was in the form of or two forms first of all the kuki rising of 1917 to 19 and secondly they contributed to the uh, freedom fight in the form of contribution during the world war 2 okay now one important news from uh, space again okay. NASA's Lucy mission right so this is again one of the interesting mission designed by NASA to study asteroids okay so first of all we will see the context what is going on Eurybates is one of the handful of the asteroids that Lucy will visit over the next 12 years so there are around 10000 such 9800 by the way but 10000 such asteroids asteroids are nothing but uh, celestial objects bodies which are termed as which are treated as the remnants of the solar system uh, which continuously revolve around the sun uh, somewhere around the jupiter's uh, you can say track right so there is one belt called as asteroid belt and another belt called as the trojan asteroids we are going to have uh, the detailing about them the eurybates is one of the handful of the asteroids that the lucy will visit so lucy is a mission by nasa going to study asteroids especially the eight asteroids out of those eight asteroids eurybates eurybates will be the one of such asteroids okay now so uh, why eurybates right recently astro astronomers at las vegas were observing a star which appeared to briefly blink out because the asteroids eurybates asteroid eurybates has passed in front of it asteroids were observing a star and the asteroid called as eurybates passed over that star that led to blinking of the star uh, while the astro astronomers were observing it the phenomena is called as occultation the phenomena of blinking or a uh, passing one subject over the another passing the uh, you can say one body celestial body over the another uh, blocking the complete view of that body which is you can say behind the uh, body which is passing which is which is called as the occultation as eurybates eclipsed the star the phenomena scientists call an occultation right 
फोर्टी माइल वाइड शेडो द साइज ऑफ दोलॉट पास ओवर वॉट एवर दैट इज दिस इन्फॉर्मेशन विल बी यूज बाय लूसी researcher to you can say supplement the data gathered by the lucian etc so they uh, it is going to uh, reach you can say lucy in the over uh, the lucy is going to reach this eurobytes and all over the let's say 8 to 10 years now then what is occultation an occultation is an any event where one celestial object passes in front of the another blocking the latter object from an observer's view the best known example is solar eclipse so solar eclipse is nothing but an process of occultation okay solar eclipse which occurs when the moon passes between the sun and the earth blocking the sun from the our view that is called as occultation you can observe here the main asteroid belt is somewhat uh you can say it resides somewhere between the mars and the jupiter and there is one another belt or another group of asteroids are specifically located on the orbit of jupiter okay which is called as trojan asteroids so trojan asteroids are those asteroids which are which lie on the uh, track of or you can uh, which lie on the orbit of jupiter okay that those are called as trojan asteroids now what are trojan asteroids these asteroids are believed to be the remnants of the early solar system and studying them will help the scientists of course yes are the main purpose of studying these asteroids and celestial bodies is nothing but uh, if we can get any clue of the evolution of the solar system evolution of the uh, biological organisms including humans so we are finding that how uh, come this uh, solar system came into existence how the universe came into existence these asteroids are believed to be the remnants of the early solar system and studying them will help the scientists to understand its origin and evolution and why it looks the way it does the trojan asteroids are believed to be formed from the same material that led to the formation of the planets nearly 4 billion years ago so asteroids are believed to be those of the same material uh, out of which the other solar system bodies are formed okay and that's how that is going to be interesting topic to study the asteroids like lucy so about lucy mission this is nasa's first mission to explore the jupiter trojan asteroid so specifically lucy mission is designed to uh, you can say explore the asteroids or the trojan asteroids okay it is a solar powered mission by the way it is estimated to be over 12 years long during which the spacecraft will visit the eight asteroids covering a distance of about 6.3 billion kilometers to deepen the understanding of the young solar system yeah now the mission is designed to understand the composition of the diverse asteroids that are part of the trojan asteroids so by the way what is trojan asteroids it is a group of asteroids specifically located on the orbit of the jupiter okay uh, to determine the mass and densities of the materials and to look for the study the satellites and uh, the rings that uh, may orbit the trojan asteroids okay now this was about so basically the concept of trojan asteroid is very important for the examination and asteroid belt is different from the trojan asteroids so trojan asteroids uh, lie outside the asteroid belt specifically on the jupiter orbit okay and lucy mission by nasa is designed to study such eight trojan asteroids trojan asteroids specifically on this belt okay now the next news was regarding uh, cyber security or uh, let's say uh, science and technology especially the computer science the blotware apps by the way before explaining what is mean by the blotware i would like to request you all please uh, uh, have a survey on the applications list on your phone first of all uh, please open up your windows and uh, please uh, see that how many apps are really important for you in that list and how many apps are just lying you can say dormant for many such weeks may say last weeks you have not used those apps this news is regarding those apps which we do not use actually okay so those apps which are not so necessary not in the use those are called as bloatware apps okay so uh, the bloatware apps uh, also known as potentially unwanted programs pup the bloatware apps are needless programs that take a toll on your devices performance and as you know these applications which are not needed um, in that extent they they actually consume your space in the phone they consume the memory and it forms a extra burden on the performance of your phone right 
and that's how it is also called as the potentially unwanted programs PUP. The bloatware apps are being criticized for taking up the storage of the device unnecessarily and affecting the system's battery life at the same time the performance. Generally, these apps that run in the background are hidden and locating them become a tough job for the users. It could be any software on your computer, phone or tablet that consumes a lot of resources like memory, storage and battery life and uh, actually they are not that much of use for you. Those are called as the bloatware apps. There are mainly three types of the bloatware apps. Firstly, they can be categorized as utilities out of three. So utilities is the first category. Utilities are nothing but the bloatware or those apps which are uh, directly uh, you can see installed into the system automatically by the manufacturer. So these types of the bloatware comes from the manufacturers and the third party developers and are usually preloaded on your devices. These offer added functionalities. These, these offer added functionality to your devices. They are called as utilities. Okay. Trailware, sorry, I'm really sorry, trialware. Trialware is such another type of the bold uh, you can say bloatware. You just can experience the app as the most of them offer free trial modes in the new devices. However, these programs keep on consuming your device even after the trial period has been over, right? And the third is adware. These types, these types of bloatware typically gets downloaded in you know, adware. They typically not downloaded while downloading the softwares from the internet. So there are three important types of the bloatware. The first is adware, the second is trialware and the third is utilities. Okay. So this was about the uh, system called as the bloatware or the potentially unwanted programs. So what is uh, by the way simple in simple terms what is bloatware? They are the potentially unwanted programs. They are needless programs that take toll on your device's performance in the form of extra memory that they consume, the extra space they consume, extra battery that they consume and etc. Okay, So these three uh, uh, types together is all called as the bloatware. So with that news I would like to take leave uh, from the February month and uh, uh, in the next session we are going to enter into the March month of course the Ukraine war will dominate the news till then I would like to thank you very much for your patience uh, we'll meet soon okay Nandip Academy India's top coaching institution for civil services preparation Join us online to get most enriching experience from best faculty with excellent notes and specially designed courses. To join the patch, download Nandi Pais Academy app from Google Play Store. For more information, contact 9511-280-465.